every day we're asking, how can we make these chickens happy? How can we make these pigs happy? How can we enable them to be, to express all of their, you know, pigness and nuances? Welcome to the Wise Traditions Podcast, sponsored by the Weston A. Price Foundation for Wise Traditions in Food, Farming, and the Healing Arts. We are your source for scientific knowledge and traditional wisdom to help you achieve optimal health. I'm your host, Tilda Labrada Gore. Our guest today is none other than Joel Salatin, a third generation farmer who owns and runs Polyface Farm in Virginia. His farm is internationally known for its innovative, compassionate, and sustainable farming practices. Today, Joel talks to us about the driving force behind his relationship to animals and the land, the belief that every living organism has a God-given uniqueness to its life that must be honored and respected. Wise Traditions is supported by White Oak Pastures, one family, one farm, five generations, 150 years. Pasture raising and hand butchering 10 species on the farm. Visit whiteoakpastures.com and the Weston A. Price Foundation. Sally Fallon Morell, the president of the foundation, is going to speak about the key to vibrant health on Sunday, May 1st at Woodrow Wilson High School in D.C. Come on out and be a part of this fantastic event. Hundreds will be there, and Sally will be answering some questions there. Do you have a question about nourishing diets? Just email us at podcast at westonaprice.org, and we'll try to get it to her. And stick close to us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We will announce soon on social media how you can tune into the event if you can't join us in person. And now, on to the conversation. Welcome to the podcast, Joel. Thank you. So tell us a little bit about Polyface. How is it so different from other farms? You've gotten a lot of attention over the years. Well, we have, we're, and, and we are very different, and I think that difference, you know, is what gives us the attention. Um, you know, when, you, when people ask, uh, well, how or why, I really just go back to some pretty simple, basic things. For example, how are we different? First of all, we believe that animals should move. That's such a simple statement. Animals should move. Or we could even make it an imperative. Animals move. You know, <laughs> you can play with the grammar. But the point is, a statement that simple is not believed by 98% of the food system of America. They don't believe animals are supposed to move. Uh, they're supposed to be locked up in cages or you know, locked up in confinement animal factories, whatever. But as soon as you say, as soon as you posit animals move, well, then you have to have portable control because, you know, the neighbor doesn't want them on his place. You have to have portable water because, you know, if you're going to move them around, they've got to be able to get water anytime. And you have to have portable shelter Mm because every day isn't 70 degrees and, you know, fluffy, puffy clouds. Um, so portable shell, shelter, portable control, and portable water. So our innovative infrastructure has not come because we sat down one day and had a focus group discussion saying, how can we be different? But rather, it was simply looking at something as simple as the fact, nature's pattern, template, animals move, and then saying, okay, so how do we how do we accommodate that? So all of the innovative infrastructure, you know, portable shelters and electric fencing and and ponds and water systems and all this stuff, all that innovation has grown out of the basic assumption animals move. I understand you invented or came up with something for the chickens in particular to move from one place where they were pecking around to another. Describe that to us. Well, it's the Eggmobile. And okay. the, the, the reason that we came up with the Eggmobile was because, again, in nature, what sanitizes behind, cat, behind herbivores? You know, look at uh, wildebeest on the Serengeti, uh, Cape buffalo in Botswana, uh, bison on the American plains. What you, had, what you have all the time are these birds that migrate or that, that you know, follow the herds of herbivores the, the egret on the rhino's nose, okay? So it's, you know, it's picking out things. So y- you have this going, it's a symbiosis between the bird and the herbivore. And so we're looking at our cow herd saying, okay, so how do we, how do we sanitize the cows? You know, they're pooping and all this stuff. And guess what? Birds. And so we have the eggmobiles with several hundred 
uh, egg layers, uh, chickens in there. The chickens free range out behind the cows. We're moving the cows every day. Every day they, they get to move move to a new little paddock. And then the chickens uh, scratch through the cow patties, eat out the fly larva, uh, eat the exposed grasshoppers and crickets, you know, and all that stuff, and sanitize the paddock uh, behind the cows. So it was strictly a way to sanitize behind the herbivores without toxic substances. You knew you didn't want to have toxic substances. No, we, we didn't. We farm. didn't want to use ivamec and, and all the grubicides, parasiticides, and all the things that the industry uses. So we said, well, how does nature do this? Herbivores have been healthy for a long time before, you know, Merck Pharmaceuticals and, and whatever, you know, came up with all these toxic substances. How did that happen? And it was birds, you know, so it was, it was a very, you know, uh, easy leap to say, well, we don't have, you know, we don't have egrets by the millions, but we, we, we can have chickens. And so uh, we simply used the chicken as a sanitizer behind the cow. And your animals are so happy, aren't they? Well, they are because they're enabled to express their, their own, you know, individual uh, distinctiveness, which is, of course, another huge difference between us and conventional farms or, or the, the orthodoxy of our day. So the, the question that that industry asks is, can we grow them fatter, faster, bigger, and cheaper? Well, you know, that's a very narrow goal. Mm-hmm. Um, and... Nothing, nothing works best at full throttle. And in, in fact, if that were healthy, you know, we'd all aspire to be the fattest person in the room, you know, if that were really healthy. And so we asked the question, how can we make the happiest chicken, the happiest pig, the happiest whatever, so that our goal is to create a habitat, a habitat that allows the full expression of the physiological and phenotypical distinctiveness of that being. And what's interesting is when you accomplish that, you don't have vet bills and you have the best, you know, nutrient density. You have the right uh, balance of omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids. You, you know, all these cool things kick in when, you know, when you do that sort of thing. When you have that value. When you have that value. It has yeah. this extra benefit that comes along with it. This is actually the topic of your next book, isn't it? Well, it is. It's the next book coming out May 7th is The Marvelous Pigness of Pigs. You know, uh, anybody that knows me knows that, you know, I've kind of taken this um, self-proclaimed moniker of Christian, libertarian, environmentalist, capitalist, lunatic farmer. Uh, and, and I did that several years ago because conservative Christians aren't supposed to be organic. You know, that's for liberal Democrat, uh, you know, uh, pinko commie tree hugger, right? So I was constantly dealing politically and spiritually and emotionally with all these assumptions. I'd walk into a room, and here's this organic farmer today, and of course I'm supposed to be, you know, uh, you know, in favor of abortion. I'm supposed to be in favor of bigger government, more intrusive government, you know, and, and, and uh, whatever, and higher taxes, you know, and, and Bernie Sanders and whatever. And so, so kind of in self-defense and, 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 and fun right. in order to, to turn a tense situation or a tense bunch of perceptions into fun, I just started saying, well, I'm a Christian, libertarian, environmentalist, capitalist, lunatic. Don't put me in a box. You know, one minute, I mean, I've had people, I've done speeches and a guy comes up to me, man, you're the best communist since Marx, you know? I mean, and he, what he heard was, you know, communism. And then another person, wow, you're the most libertarian I've heard since, you know, Ron Paul. And, and so people tend to hear what, hear what they want to hear mm-hmm. and they dismiss the other. And so I've just had fun with this because at, at one point you, you just get tired of all the stereotypes, the boxes. Right. Okay. And so this book is dealing with the first part of that moniker, the Christian aspect. And that is, it really bothers me that the religious right, the faith community, call it what you will, has pretty much been a shill, uh, you know, a, a disciple of the industrial food system. And in fact, in the average church, uh, if you go in and, and, and you dare to say, you know, how about at the next potluck we use paper plates or maybe we go down to the to the Salvation Army uh, thrift store and buy a bunch of cheap secondhand plates and we'll wash them instead of using styrofoam. 
Boy, if you even mention that, suddenly your descent, your pounced on as, what are you, some sort of tree-hugging, pinko, commie, you know, uh, liberal. And, and we can't even have a conversation. Uh-huh. We go into the, the fellowship group and everybody is in agreement. You know, God owns everything. It's all God's stuff. You know, we say, you know, for the beauty of the earth, we sing these wonderful songs about that God owns everything. And and yet we can't have a discussion. Does does God care how His stuff gets treated? We can't even have that conversation right, right. because to have that, you, you've just you've just gone to the dark side. You've gone to the you know the, the pagans, the animists. And so anyway, so this book, the whole thesis is that all of physical creation is an object lesson of spiritual truth. So the question is, when you come to my farm and you look around, walk around, and you leave. Have you seen forgiveness? Mm. Have you seen beauty? Have you seen neighborliness? Have you seen whosoever will, i.e. anyone can do this. There aren't big capital barriers of entry. If you want to grow a chicken for Tyson, the first thing you got to do is build a half a million dollar confinement house. You can start with pastured poultry with pocket change. (laughs) That is a whosoever will. Okay, it's not an elitist fraternity. It's the chickens in your backyard. Yes, it's the chickens in your backyard. You you, you can do it uh, on a, on a shoestring, and so it's something that is that is uh, democratized. It's 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 participatory. You see the point that that yeah. what we want is we want to be able to have a food and farming system that actually viscerally demonstrates the kinds of spiritual principles we would preach from the pulpit. But we live in such a segregated, disconnected existence that we, you say, well, that's, that's spiritual. Food and farming doesn't have a spiritual or a moral connotation. And I categorically reject that. You know, if there's one thing that, that grown-ups understand, it is that your moral ethical framework permeates every part of your life. So are you saying God does care what we eat? Yes. And how we treat the food we raise? Yes. Yes, ab- absolutely. If we posit that he owns all this, well, he's looking for a return on investment. And his return on investment is not soil erosion. It's not making more deserts. It's not making more sick people. He loves people. He doesn't want us to be sick. Okay. Okay. I, and I'm not saying sickness is sin. Don't don't read more into that. All, all I'm suggesting is that, you know, his return on investment, he created this, his return on investment is not what we've been giving back. We, we've been exploiting, raping, and, and just uh, greedily taking without... You know, he he put, that- he, he put a sun in the sky to send down these, these sunbeams of energy. Well, we're supposed to be... We're supposed to be taking our hands and where we touch we should be taking more of those sunbeams turning them into biomass through photosynthesis that sequester carbon that feeds the mycorrhizae and the earthworms and the soil food web that's what we're supposed to do not less of it but more of it and, and yet and yet too often the hand of man has been one of depleting sunbeams turned into biomass what if I say to you, I'm just buying my food. I'm just living my regular life in the city. I don't know what you, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm not the one pillaging the land, am I? Every piece of food you eat creates the landscape your grandchildren will inherit. Ultimately, the food choices that we make do create actually impact the landscape because obviously if we're buying a chicken from Tyson, that posits a very different landscape ethic than if you're buying a chicken from a pastured poultry farmer who thinks chickens should run around and get bugs and fresh air and grass and all that. Uh, it's, a, it's a very, very different paradigm. And I, I, would go, I would go even a little bit farther and just point out that the, the ethical framework that your food represents then ultimately demonstrates or manifests the value system of a culture as a whole. If animals are just inanimate particles of protoplasm to be manipulated however cleverly hubris can imagine to manipulate them, it's not much of a stretch to assume all of life is inanimate or manipulatable. And so suddenly, guess what? 
uh, we start viewing our citizens from the same kind of top-down manipulative element as we do our pigs or our tomatoes or anything else. And then we start looking at foreign cultures as the same way. And we need to manipulate them to make them like us. And instead of coming at life humbly saying, you know, the reason a cow is like she is and a tomato is like it is, is because that is what makes a successful cow. That's what makes a successful tomato. And, you know, right now, for example, our tax dollars are funding research at land-grant universities to find the stress gene in pigs, for example, so that, so that we can genetically, so we can strip that stress gene out of their DNA. That way we can abuse them, disrespect them more egregiously, but they won't care. And, and I would suggest that a society that views life with that degree of disrespect, of sacrilege, if you will, it will necessarily produce a society that is violent toward life, that is disrespecting of life, that is, that is walking in an unethical, immoral, unsacred space. Wouldn't this line of reasoning take people to think that the best thing to do is to leave the animals alone altogether and not eat them? Isn't that letting a pig be a pig and a cow be a cow? All right. Great. That's a great question. The whole animal welfare deal. Okay. All right. Here's the thing. All of life is eating and being eaten. You cannot have life without death. I mean, there are never as many beings dying any place as in a compost pile. That's how a compost pile works. You've got, you know, microorganisms and bacteria and, of course, all the little roly-polies and worms and whatever, okay, and, and, and they're, you know, they're eating and everything is eating and being eaten. And if you don't believe it, go lie naked in your flower bed for three days and see what gets eaten, okay? <laughs> Something will get eaten, all right? Perhaps, you know, one of the most unspoken foundations of ecology is that in order for there to be life, there must be death. So you, so you have this life, death, decomposition, regeneration, life, death, decomposition, regeneration. Like the seasons. Like the seasons, like like the leaves that, you know, and, and people talk about, well, but any animals are sentient. Let me tell you something. All of life is sentient. When leaves uh, get bitten and then secrete uh, pheromones and, and phenols that move downwind and those trees then make their leaves bitter so they won't taste as well to the um, defoliator, you know, the giraffe or whatever, all right, that's eating them. That is sentience. When the sunflower tracks the sun, that's sentience. I mean, uh, w when you tap a maple tree, for example, in the spring and you, you know, drill a little hole in the, in the trunk of it and, it and it starts giving you sap, if a windstorm comes up, the sap stops because the tree is protecting itself because the sap is its blood. And the tree is saying to itself, I don't know what language it's using, but the tree <laughs> is saying to itself, ooh, there's a really big windstorm coming up. I'm going to stop this little wound. So I have plenty of sap that if I have a big wound, like a tree, like a branch falls off, I can send a bunch of sap to there to heal that wound. As soon as the wind stops, it starts sending sap back out your little wound. That is sentience. We want to pause now and thank our sponsors, White Oak Pastures, one family, one farm, five generations, 150 years. Pasture raising and hand butchering grass-fed beef, lamb, goat, and pastured chickens, turkeys, ducks, geese, guineas, hogs, and rabbits. Go to whiteoakpastures.com. And listeners like you. On iTunes, Super Violin Hero had this to say, I owe my good health and my family's good health to the WAPF principles. It has literally changed my life. I'm so glad to see this podcast. This info needs to get into more people's hands. Keep it up. Thanks, Super Violin Hero. Your review was very encouraging. And now back to the program. It's a wonderful explanation of how minerals in the soil and the rhizomial horizon of the root hairs and a, a plant has thousands of miles of actual root hairs on a on a plant and it's essentially a cafe 
I'll trade you, the, the plant says, I'll trade you some polysaccharides for a molecule of zinc. And so the rock gives up its, you know, and, and, and the bacteria are all, they're all, they're the tradesmen, you know, and they're, and they're, they're. It's a little exchange. It, it, there's an exchange. It's like a cafe. And, and this is all going on. My point is that everything is eating and being eaten. And it's one of the most foundational aspects, I think, of our human existence to realize the preciousness of life. Something had to give its life, whether it's a carrot or a chicken, something had to give its life for me to live. That is profound. And, and I think gives us a much greater appreciation of sanctity of life. Now, if life requires sacrifice, then how do we sanctify a sacrifice? I suggest it's by the respect and honor we gave to that being in its life. That's what elevates it. If we view that being, whether it's a carrot, tomato, or chicken, if we view that being as just a blob as just inanimate particle and disrespect it, then we cheapen that life and therefore cheapen and desecrate the sacrifice that that life gave to us. And in doing so, we even cheapen our own life. So if we want to elevate this to a place of specialness and sacredness and honor, we do it in life. And then when the sacrifice occurs, we have an elevated sacred place, spiritually, mentally, and emotionally, to go to appreciate what's just happened. So how does that play out on the farm? How does it play out on the farm? Well, what it means is that every day we're asking, how can we make these chickens happy? How can we make these pigs happy? How can we, how can we enable them to be, to express all of their, you know, pigness and nuances, okay? And then when we take their life, we have done all we can to give them the best life possible, which then enables them to give us the best life possible. Now, because I'm a city girl, I don't know much about the pigness of a pig. So describe how you let the pig have that happy life. All right. Well, sure. Well, first of all, um, you know, those pigs have a plow on the end of their nose. I mean, that's what they're known for, right? And so, um, I mean, and they have a full tail. And so we want the pigs to be able to root, to plow things, to run around, and to, you know, to scoop out uh, lounge places, to be able to interact socially in, in a non-stressful way, to act, to interact in a community, as opposed to, to cannibalizing each other, which is why they, they cut off their tails in the factories, to make the tail so tender that when they begin to cannibalize, the pig will move away instead of letting you bite on it and draw blood and, and, and then all the pigs eat the, the bloody pig. You know, look, if you've got a situation in which you have to you have to cut off the tail to make a tender stub to keep the pig protected from being eaten by his cellmates, that is not a, that is not a respectful place for the pig. Right. And so, and so we, you know, we let them build compost for us by turning compost. We, we put them out in pig pastures where they're in, you know, like half acre paddocks. We move them every few days to a new paddock. We put them in the, in the forest and the acorn glens, they eat acorns and bugs and all that stuff, you know, so they get to, to root a lot. Yeah, they have, they are a very, very happy pig. Now, what if you just let the pig go? Let's say someone isn't convinced by your argument. They're like, I just want the pig to be happy and free. And they just let it go in the forest like its ancestors were. What would happen? <laughs> well, first of all, uh, you know, it would, it would finally meet its demise. And it might be, meet its demise by a bear, uh, by a wolf. Um, it might meet its demise uh, by cold, you know, freezing to death, starving to death. Uh, I mean, there are lots of ways to meet its demise. So you have to understand that there is no animalist ecology and there's as much violence on the plains of the Serengeti as there is anywhere else. What makes that violence, I mean, like a lion, you know, uh, grabbing a wildebeest calf or cow? The truth is that this whole uh, this whole violence thing is a part of life, mm -hmm. and uh, as much as you'd like it, there's a, there's a tension every day. Uh, I mentioned this under soil commerce going on. 
goodness, every plant is fighting for a place in the sun. No, I'm bigger than you. And there's a there's a competitive element that that actually the striving, uh, the striving is is what makes life interesting and amazing and and makes the planet function. So when people say it's a dog eat dog world, they're not kidding. No, they're not kidding. It, it is a dog eat dog world. I mean, I spent a lot of time in the forest. We have a lot of forest here. I spent a lot of time there, and every tree is trying to outdo its neighbor to become the dominant tree and a lot of trees die you know because they don't they don't have what it takes they don't they don't make it you know and um, it's a very unforgiving unforgiving thing when we feed the animals here the, the 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 biggest pig doesn't stand aside and say i think we'll let all the little pigs eat first you know nobody does that a tomato in your garden uh does not say I think I'll forego uh, taking up any nutrients today so that all my neighbor tomatoes can... No, no, no. (laughs) That's not how it works. It's not. It's not. And and so, and that's why we, that's, that's why we're intuitively drawn to competition, to excellence, to, we, we all, we clap for the, the best grades, the best performance, the best, okay. I mean, it's, it's that, it's that striving to compete that, that's mastery. It's ultimate mastery. The biggest pumpkin at the county fair gets yeah, the ribbon, right? That's right. Not not the littlest one. The big, now, it might not be the best nutrition, okay? And bigger's not always better. But I, I'm talking about, you know, just striving for excellence and mastery. You know, that that's, a, that, that's not a bad thing. It brings out the best in us. So as we start to wrap up, what would you recommend to our listeners? What are ways in which we can value the pigness of a pig or... Uh, value this earth well i think i think one of the best ways that you can uh, value it is to simply put your money where your mouth is and if you say that you value this well then start purchasing from farmers who do and that very possibly will entail spending a little more time in your kitchen uh, because every farmer is not going to have a you know a tv dinner and a you know a a squeezable um, squeezable Velveeta, velveeta cheese you know, you're going to buy chunks of cheese uh, and you have to cut them, you know, with your own knife and keep them refrigerated or they'll grow mold and walk off the table in a couple of days. Uh, <laughs> but that's living food. You know, that, that, that's the real deal. Uh, so it, it'll mean that you have to you have to come down off the stands and you have to join this this wonderful game of, of healing. And it's such a privilege to be able to be in that game. You don't have to, you know, you don't have to be a a finger pointer or a bleacher sitter. You can actually be a part of that. That's why on our uh, handbags at, at Polyface, our, our little uh, freezer bags that we use, our little m- motto is healing the planet or healing the land one bite at a time. Because every bite that you take is either moving a healing agenda forward or an exploitive hurting agenda forward. You know, it's it's the old uh, the old uh, parable about which dog are you going to feed. You know, yes. it, it's that deal. And, and I don't want to turn this into a cult. I mean, I like a Snickers bar once a month too. Okay, but but once a month is different than a, every day. Okay, and so I, I don't want this. And I don't want anybody to be an ungracious. If you go to somebody's house and you know they serve you something that you wouldn't normally eat, it's okay. Enjoy it. Be a gracious host. Don't turn this into something you wear on your sleeve or it becomes a cult to you. But at the end of the week, as you look back at the end of your week, can you put your food choices on a balance sheet and say, on balance, this week I have nurtured the landscape rather than patronizing something that has not been good. And when people do that, they're nurturing themselves at the same time. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. It, it's, the ultimate, it's the ultimate value of yourself and, and your own family. Tell you what, there, there, are, there are few people who get this like moms who decide I'm going to take care of my little ones and boy that is a wonderful force and and when I see moms just dumping lollipops and Pepsi and stuff in their kids I'm just I mean it you know, I mean, they don't have evil intent I'm not I'm not saying that it, it's totally in ignorance yeah. and I understand that okay but it, it breaks my heart to know that those kids are being denied essential, you know, fatty acids for their brains, and they're they're setting up a 
what, a, a lifelong set of, of deficiencies, some of which will not be manifest until they're in their 50s or 60s. But it's, a, it's wonderful to see moms especially, my hat's off to moms, who actually get this and say, I'm going to be that, that fierce protector. I'm going to be that lioness for my family. And I'm not going to let all that junk get in here. That's, that's, that's a profound thing and probably one of the most visceral healing things anyone can do for our planet. What a beautiful thing. Well, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us today. I hope we can talk again sometime soon. Thank you. I do too. Thanks for listening today. Become a member of the Weston A. Price Foundation for $40 or $25 if you're a student or a senior. Your contribution helps us to get this important health information to people all around the world. Go to our website, westonaprice.org, and click on Become a Member. Again, thanks for listening. Wise Traditions is brought to you by the Weston A. Price Foundation for wise traditions in food farming and the healing arts.